So let's, if you have your Bibles, turn with you to John chapter 4. Uh, our teaching is going to come from a story about a Samaritan woman at a well, and Jesus uh, meets her there. And it's actually a story about worship, which is odd, but I'll explain that in a minute. But John chapter 4, verses 16 through 26. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. (laughs) Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You can be seated. Um, I I don't normally like to preach topically. That's when you have topics and then you go to the Bible to find the scripture that covers that topic. Um, When when pastors do that too much, it's easy to get off course. It's easy to forget context. It's easy to miss the larger story. It's why we preach expositionally here at Eternal most often. But uh, it was helpful this week because I I did a word study on the word worship, and John 4 kept coming up. And I was surprised that John 4 kept coming up as a high uh, usage for that word. Um, Because I've always known this story to have a lot to teach us us about cross-cultural evangelism, and maybe even there's some messaging there about Jesus radical for his day, respect and honor and empowerment to women to carry the gospel to others. But I also now see this, because of that study, as a, as a story about worship. Over ten times that word is used in this text. As Jesus banters back and forth with this Samaritan woman about what worship is and where it is and how it happens. And so I'm going to bring in maybe a few other texts, but let's just go ahead and look at this scripture in order to answer a few crucial questions that this scripture will answer in regards to worship. And here's the three questions. I'll give them to you. We'll cover each one. First one, what is worship? It's important for us to agree on the terminology, right? And that is here. Secondly, why is worship so essential for the church? That's the actual, the, the beef of the sermon is, is, is why is that essential? Therefore, now that we know what it is, why is it essential for a spiritual church to worship? And then third, how do we worship well? How can we be known as a church who does this well, who worships well? So let's just go through those. The first question, what is worship? Every time the word is used in this text, it is a form of the Greek word proskuneo. Okay, proskuneo is the most popular word in the New Testament for this word. Uh, proskuneo, the, the, the meaning of that word is straightforward, it's pretty clear. It means to prostrate oneself before a superior. And the word wasn't used just in regards to the Lord. The word was uh, used for, you know, proskuneo to a king or to a high-ranking official, to a regent. But it meant literally to bow down or lay down to hit the deck before somebody who has great authority great value great worth and so that's the technical definition that's what they used it for she's using it in that way but let's talk about what it means because if, as you can see there's two parts to that prostrating yourself before a superior here's the two parts let me break them up so you see them first of all it must first mean that I see or acknowledge that something is greater than myself, right? So I see, I'm acknowledging that I'm in the presence of something much greater than me. And secondly, then you're simply assuming a reasonable or an appropriate position or stance or lack of stance before that greatness. And if not the person, obviously the office, maybe we would say. So those are the two parts together in worship. I see, I acknowledge, and then I do something that should come natural to that acknowledgement. So now that we've captured that meaning and the meaning in the New Testament, I think it can breathe a little bit more now. We can get out of the cultural context, keep its meaning, and say a little bit more about what church worship looks like. So church worship is the process 
of seeing, acknowledging, knowing, experiencing God for who he is. So it's ascribing ultimate worth to God in such a way the experience is so right and good and true that it engages our hearts, our emotions, our actions, our will, our minds, and we align who we are appropriately under that worth we have ascribed. Now, I've just used a lot of words to say that worship is seeing and experiencing God for who he is so that we become who we were really meant to be. The English word worship, the Bible doesn't use that word, worship, use the meaning, prostrate, but it's actually an English word, and the old English word is worthship. So if you look up the etymology of worship, you'll come up with worthship, and that's what they used to say. It's the act of ascribing worth to someone or something, and it carries the same essence of the New Testament. Worthship. Let me give you an example from everyday life that I hope will allow greater clarity. Let's say uh, you're a mom and you have a daughter and you take her over to your mom's house, grandma's house. And you say to your mom, hey mom, remember all those dress up clothes that we used to have with the costume jewelry and all of those cute dresses? And uh, do you still have that crate? And she says, absolutely I do. Oh yeah, I remember I used to dress up as a little girl and play with all those dresses. And she says, sure honey, it's upstairs in the attic. Well, Mom, I was wondering if I could just go ahead and grab it and go through it because now my little girl is at the age she wants to play dress-up and I remembered that we had all these, these dress-up clothes and she says, sure, honey, go get it. It's yours. And so off you go and you go home that day and, of course, you're a good mom, so you're going through it and washing all of the dresses and everything and cleaning it up and you come across your favorite piece of jewelry that you remember, a diamond brooch that you used to wear all the time and you give it to your little girl to wear. Two months Later, fast forward, a friend of yours who just happens to be a jeweler comes over to your house with her little girl, and they're playing dress up in the box, and this beautiful ornamental pin ends up on this lady's own daughter, and she says, come here, honey, where did you get that jewel, that piece of jewelry? This brooch is gorgeous. Where, where did you get that? And <coughs> you pipe in as a mom, well, it's costume jewelry. I used to wear that all the time. It was from my mom. I think it got passed down from her mom. I remember when I was a little girl, I used to wear that, that jewelry all the time. Even when I played outside climbing trees, I was kind of a tomboy, but I would still have that brooch on. I put it on my backpack when I went to school. And your friend takes it off of her daughter, and she looks at it, and she turns it over, and she pauses, and she says, listen, you know, this is not costume jewelry. Now, I can't imagine, however, that it's actually real, but it sure does look real, and it's not costume jewelry, so why don't you bring it down to my jewelry store Monday morning. I'm, I, there's somebody there, the owner of the store, uh, is great at appraising jewelry. Let's just take a look at it. And the mom says, okay. This time, however, instead of throwing it back in the crate or pinning it back on your daughter, you take it off, right? And you put it in an old matchbox, maybe, and you put it on the kitchen counter because it's the weekend and life goes on. Monday morning, you almost forget, but you say, oh yeah, I'm going to take that over to the jeweler. And you, and you take off your matchbox and you bring it over to the jeweler, jeweler and um, your friend goes back with the matchbox. And about 30 minutes later, after a long time, you start hearing these muffled noises and squeals of excitement and these kind of hushed tones. And you're like, what is going on? And finally, the jeweler comes out with your best friend and says, ma'am, <laughs> this is not only real, it's the most amazing piece of jewelry I've ever appraised. It's, it's made of the finest gems I've ever seen. In fact, he goes on to tell you that it, it, it was certainly from a, a famous uh, man in, who lived in France in the 17th century who used to make jewelry for a queen. And, and he says to you, it's not only a priceless work of art, it has extreme s historical significance. And you say, well, uh, this is crazy. This is too much for me. Are you sure? And he says, yes, I'm sure. And you say, well, how much is it worth? And he says, <coughs> he says that's just it. It's priceless. I mean, it's actually priceless. It's worth millions, of course, but it's also worth whatever somebody's willing to pay. Now, let me pause the illustration there for just a minute now that you took that little ride with me. I want you to think about what's happened. Now, what has happened is this person has just been awakened to something that has always been true, right? The jewel has always carried this worth. It's always been worth that much. It's always been true, but now she knows it to be true. 
And now other people will know. She's going to tell grandma about it. She's going to call grandma. She's going to talk to her friends. She's going to, she, you know, it's an awakening moment, which we call worship. But it's not the end of worship. It's the beginning of worship. Because what else will happen? Put yourself in her shoes now. How will you act? What, else, what are the implications of this worth that you've ascribed to this piece of jewelry? First of all, her thinking will change. She's going to, I guarantee, she's going to go home and she's going to look at it more. She's going to look at it more than she ever has, even as a little girl. She's going to turn it over in her hand. She's going to sit. She's going to look at it. She might even get something to look at it more closely in a way she never did before. Because the jeweler has now pointed out its worth, how rare the metal, how the settings are. The, the, the hinges are un, unknown to them, how they did that. The jewels are amazing. And now you will be looking all at all of those things as well because somebody pointed it out. Somebody who knew the jewel pointed them out. And now you're looking more closely. What else is going to change? Her affections. She liked the jewel before, but now how do you think she feels about the jewel? Now she really loves. Now she sees it as more beautiful than she did before. She loves that piece of jewelry. What else is going to change? Her actions. Do you think that she's going to put that jewel back in the crate? Do you think she's going to pin it back on her daughter or on her backpack as she goes to school Tuesday morning? No, 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 no. She's not even going to put it in the old matchbox and set it on the kitchen counter. That's done. Like now she's trying to figure out how will I keep it? Where will I keep it? Where's a safe place in the world for me to hold such a thing? How can I keep it and protect it? What else is going to change? Well, her attitudes. Right? Before she went into the jeweler, she was going to only pay half of her electric bill so that she could make a full mortgage payment. Her daughter has need braces for a year. But she doesn't have money for that, and she's always worried in her heart, well, will kids make fun of her because she has that little crooked tooth? I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. She's worried about it. She used a credit card <clears throat> the last time she went shopping for groceries. She made three, three meals over the last week with one pack of chicken breasts. Her couch has four or five holes in it. None of those circumstances have changed, have they? All of those things are still true. But now, how do you think she's going to feel about those same circumstances? And then what about her future kind of, we'll say, obedience or carrying her cross of the worth? The jeweler mentioned that if she really wants to get the full worth, she should probably take that piece of jewelry, jewelry to one place in Switzerland, to one renowned person who, is, who can clean it and restore it properly. But it'll take five to $10,000 for him to do that. Is she going to wilt at that suggestion and say, oh, it's just too much, I can't do that? I bet you she'll say, of course, of course, I'll fly there next week right? Because what's a couple thousands of do uh, dollars when you're holding on to millions and millions more? What's $5,000 for braces? What's a $7,000 credit card bill? Nothing. She'll never shop at Aldi again. She'll never walk into that store. She'll try to own them, right? She's done with Aldi. Everything has changed. Everything. Because you now have a before and an after in her life. She's been awakened. And that awakening has resulted in appropriate responses based on her assessment of the worth. That, my friends, my church friends and brothers and sisters, is worthship. It's seeing, responding to the ultimate worth that we find in God. When Job wrestled in the book of Job, it's a, it's a book about the wrestling of somebody and through suffering and his friends are coming and they're talking back and forth about what it is. Finally, God breaks through all of the mess, and he speaks. And he explains to Job what? He's trying to say, this is who I am. This is my worth. This is my value. You never understood. You've never really known how powerful and great and awesome and glorious I am. And the interesting thing is after that happens, after that voice through the thunderstorm of the clouds, Job says, you know, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I love that response, but it's so hilarious to me because if you read his response, he actually never saw God. So he said, my ears had heard of you, and now I've seen you. He didn't see him. What he's saying is, my ears heard. It was flat on a page. It was intellectual knowledge. But now I actually know you. Now through your words, I actually understand who you are. It's Job's way of saying, I've been to the jeweler. I've had something, but I've never actually understood its worth now i now that i actually know who you are the appropriate response for him and it was to repent when isaiah sees god in isaiah 6 it's not like isaiah didn't know god existed he loved he knew god he, he knew god existed uh, god was not you know unknown to him but isaiah in that moment in isaiah isaiah 6 has an experience with god's presence there's a vision 
He sees angels. There's a temple. There's a throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, right? All of the angels singing. And after that vision, God has this awful job because he wants somebody to go preach for the rest of their life and have no converts, right? That's essentially the job. Terrible job. I want you to preach for the rest of your life and nobody will ever listen to you. And Job says, ooh, 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 send me. Right? God says, who shall I go? Who shall, who shall I send for that job? And Job, Job can't wait to take it. Why? Because he's, he's, uh, he's experienced worthship. Isaiah has now seen, experienced, and is responding to a new revelation, a new spiritual breakthrough, his, which is his evaluation of God. And that, my friends, is worthship. Worthship is seeing God's worth and responding appropriately to that worth. And the more value, the more ultimate value, the more intensely clear, the, the better and the right your evaluation of God's worth, the more comprehensive and the more radical your response will be. It all depends on your va- evaluation of God and your behavior will follow. And that is worship. Ascribing worth, and if it's God, it should be ultimate worth, and then responding appropriately to where you have ascribed that worth. That's what you now care about. Your whole life is centered on that. Okay? So that's worship. But now, let's talk a little bit about why that is so important for the church. This is um, so simple of an answer, you're going to, you know, be mad at me. But this is why it's so important for the church. Because worship is not optional for human beings. I want you to think about that. All humans, good, bad, evil, right? Dahmer, Hitler, Sandy Patty, Michael Smith. (laughs) You can tell my age. (laughs) All are worshipers. We're all created, in other words, to find who we are by looking outside of ourselves. Nobody, I don't care what your culture says, nobody can be alone on an island with a mirror and discover meaning, hope, identity, joy, love. In fact, we know humans can't even develop outside of other humanity, being able to see. We've had these tests. We know what, what happens when somebody isn't looking outside of themselves at something. So no matter how much you hear in your culture, it doesn't matter what you, it doesn't matter what so-and-so says, it doesn't matter what so-and-so thinks, it actually does. It does, it matters, it's not true. Now, there's a good Christian message to say it only matters what God thinks. But if you don't have God, somebody's got to tell you who you are. Somebody's got to tell you if you play piano, you're a good pianist, right? And your parents can only tell you that for so long. And pretty soon you're like, you know what? You guys can't play piano. I'm not sure I trust that evaluation anymore, right? So a greater pianist tells you you're a great pianist. Now you know, right? We have to look outside ourselves to know who we are, how we measure up. And so the world, therefore, is not made up of people who worship and people who don't worship. The world is divided between people who worship something that makes them less fully human or people who worship the only true object worthy of our soul worship and therefore makes us fully human, fully beautiful. Our hearts must ascribe worth somewhere. Now, you say, well, okay, it's hidden, but you notice in the text here, there's, an, there's some back and forth between Jesus. This Samaritan woman, does she just come to Jesus as a blank slate? She's never worshipped before. She doesn't know what worship is. No, of course not. She has worshipped. Jesus said, in fact, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with isn't your own. Why? Why? What's he pointing to? He's pointing to her place of worship. You see, in her life as a woman, in her century in her culture she has looked out at somehow some way somehow maybe as a little girl she looked out and she said that's how I'm gonna make it that's how I'm gonna know that I'm worth something that's how I this that's my way forward in my gender and who I am as a woman this is my only way forward here this is how I know I'm gonna be valued this is how this is the only way for me to have security and comfort this is the only way that I'm gonna know that I'm beautiful or worthy And so her life follows her worship. Her life follows what her eyes have seen. So whatever we worship changes us. It controls us. And even, here's the thing, even if it makes us better in one area, when we worship something less than God, we become less in other areas. Right? 
so it's easy. You look at this lady, and like most people in here are going to say, well, that's not who I am, right? That's like, again, throwback from the past, but my dad would say it's like Zsa Zsa Gabor or Elizabeth Taylor, right? Like these are people that just keep looking for love. I remember Zsa Zsa Gabor said, uh, I think she said, um, you marry for love, and you keep marrying until you find it, <laughs> right? That's, that's Zsa Zsa Gabor. So that's what she was doing. And most of us say, that's not how I'm going to worship. Okay, well, fine. Well, let me give something for our culture. A mom has a baby. This could be a dad, but I'll just say mom. Could be either. But here's what happens to you, whether you're a mom or a dad. You look at the baby for the first time. And when we, I think most of us have experienced it, and when you see that baby for the first time, something happens. You know you're never going to be the same again. You hold the baby. You touch the little face of the baby. You keep touching the little face. It's so soft. You look at their eyes. They're so vulnerable, so perfect, so perfect. You know what's happening? The Bible calls that adoration. You're adoring creation. It's worship. You're drawing out. Worship is drawing out the beauty. Every time you look at the baby, if it's somebody else looking at the baby, they'll go, no, it kind of looks like, you know, Winston Churchill. But you look at the baby, you say, this is the most beautiful baby in the world. Right? You're drawing out the beauty. You're touching it all the time. Those little fingers, those chubby feet that are hardly like flat at the end, they're so chubby. And those little f rolls on the thighs. And you clean your baby and you hold it and you smell it. You've never smelled anything that nice before. And guess what's happening to you? It's changing you. It's changing you. There are implications to worshiping a baby. You care more. You're the first one to notice that little bug bite on the edge of the, his, his or her feet, that little bump that doesn't belong there on the shoulder, that little rash, and you address those problems immediately. You, 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 you care for this baby in ways that surprise yourself. You'll stay up. You never used to be a night person. Now you're up to, at midnight with this baby. You get up at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. to feed this baby. You clean up after, you would never clean up after the dog, but now you're cleaning up worse things from this baby, right? What? There are implications to worship. You love the baby. Everything changes. Your schedule changes. Your resources follow that. Your money, your time, everything's following your worship. Why? Because you have seen something in which you have ascribed worth and your body, your implications, your behaviors appropriately respond to the worth that you've placed upon that object, which is the baby. Now, okay, does that kind of worship make you a better parent? Now, I could give a different sermon for an hour and say that probably not, but I don't want you to be mad at me, so let's just all agree that the answer is yes, you are a better parent because you've seen great worth in this baby because we all know there are babies who grow up without people ascribing them worth and that's never a good thing but let me ask you a different question does it make you a better person hmm now it's a different question right so think about all of the other people in this mother's life how might this kind of a parent respond to another parent who corrects their child how might this parent respond to another child or think about another child who's mean to their child, who bullies their child? How might this parent respond to a coach who treats their child unfairly in favor of another or a teacher who doesn't give the same grace you give, who turns in a paper just a couple minutes late or just a couple things that they could have easily overlooked and they didn't? How might this parent um, respond to all of the other areas of her life? How might this parent be responding romantically to a husband who hasn't seen her in anything but a moo-moo for eight months? How might this person be more kind, gentle, loving, romantic, passionate, and all of the other, hardworking? What would her employer say? Does she show up earlier now? Does she work later? Is she more tired at work? Is she a better worker? And the answer, of course, is no, almost in all the other areas. Why? Because the child has gained ultimate worth and therefore controls the narrative. What about a person, let's give a, something that's generally for men, but it could be for women as well, just like the, the, the baby. A, a young man's outside smoking a cigarette outside of his work, workplace, boss pulls in, fly clothes, beautiful, like this man that's cut, right? He has a Barbie kind of a girl on, next to him, another one in the back seat and a Lamborghini gets out, right? And this kid looks and says, Oh my gosh, that is amazing, <laughs> right? And what, what's the first thing he does? Worship. He sees and he says, that is great. 
And the boss walks up to this kid who's smoking a cigarette and says, you know what? If you do X, Y, Z, like lays it out, this is your future as well, buddy. And, 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 and all you have to do is do these things. And something clicks for him. And what happens is worship. He has seen something that speaks to him. It might be the power, the authority, the, the value, the passion. And his life will respond appropriately. All of his life will now bent, will be bent toward that vision. How early will he come to work? He'll be there before anybody else. How late is he going to stay? He'll stay later than anybody else. The clothes that he chooses, picks out the next day to come to work, will be different than the ones he did before because now he's responding. And he'll respond to the challenges and setbacks in the workplace in a different way than he did before. He's seen and he's heard and now he knows what to do. His focus is supreme. His self-discipline is there. So that if you go to that boss and you say, is this a better worker than you had two years ago? He'll say, absolutely. He's, he's the best I have. He's only gotten better, and he gives a glowing report. Now, let me ask you a question, people of the church. Let's say he's a better worker. Is he a better person? What would his children say? What would his spouse say about him? Is he a better husband now or less of a husband? What about his church community? Does his work ethic and driven nature and goals make him a better elder or deacon? What about his child's teacher he had a Zoom call with because his child wasn't performing well? What would his child's teacher say about his personality? You see, what would all of the other people in all the other, other arenas of his life say about him? Has he gotten better everywhere? No, 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 no. That's not true. It can't. Don't you see, if you worship a child, that child controls you, controls the narrative, and you only get better in that area. If you worship a job, then power will control you. The idea of power, if you worship a skill or a talent, then that will control you and you'll lose other people in your life, other places where you just can't do what you want to do for them. If you worship beauty, if you worship body shape, guess how you're going to know if you're somebody. Whatever you, whatever you worship, that's where everything goes for you and you become fractured in all of the other places, less fully human to all of the other areas of your life. And by the way, if you want to know where you're worshiping, because I don't know where it is, let's... I don't, think, I don't think all of us put all of our chips on God. So if you want to find out where your other worship chips are, ask yourself two questions. Where do you most effortless, effortlessly spend your resources? Now, we all spend resources where it's harder to spend them, right? We go, really, I have to pay that bill? Or really, you know, it might be, really, it's another tithe this week, maybe you do. Maybe you say that, or really, I have to give to this fund. Where do you most effortlessly give your money? Where do you most effortlessly give your time? When somebody says, I need something, you're like, no problem, we'll make, it, we'll make it work. No problem, I'll show up, I'll cancel something, I'll be there. Where are those places? And that's probably where you worship. Second question, where do you feel the most fear? Because you can't lose it. If you lose that, you're gone, you're dead. Where do you have the most fear about losing? And when you get that idea, that's just a little side note. That's a little self-evaluation tool to kind of figure out where your worship might be and where it should, it should not be. So now let's go back to that question I posed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now why is church worship so crucial? Can you see it now? The reason all of those other places distort us in some area of our life so that we become better or more beautiful maybe in one area or maybe even in two and we actually get uglier or worse in other areas is because the places where God has chosen to reflect his glory have become places where we've tried to find the glory. I want to say that again. Worship is wrong when we, and we become less fully human when we try to find glory in places where God has chosen to only reflect his glory. I hope that makes sense to you because it gets out of this like bad people, good people. Good people worship poorly too sometimes, right? This is about people in the church even worshiping the moon and the stars. And the only place that deserves our worship, the only place that won't distort us is when we go to the sun, S-U-N, and this, the center of the universe. That's a place where the light originates, where glory originates, not a place where it's reflected and only when we see God, his glory like Isaiah, his power and sovereignty like Job, his sweetness like the prostitute caught in sin, his vulnerability as he cries out on the cross, only when we see God's glory can we become actually more beautiful in all the areas. Because what he does is he solves all the puzzles we were looking to get solved in all the other places. Does that make sense? 
You see, now finally we know how, we know how now finally to hold on to a baby, love a baby, protect a baby, see the beauty of a baby. But also now we can release the baby. Allow the baby to grow in maturity and purpose, to let them go, to let them fail. Somebody who worships a baby can't do that. Now we know how to hold on to jobs and, and love spouses and, and hold on to money and use money and have friends and actually we're more beautiful. We're, we're more fully human in all of those areas because we respond appropriately to all the other areas of our life. They, they get in line. The church holds up the sun, God's glory, so that all the moons and the stars can get aligned for us. Do you see the difference? That's why it's so important for the church. The church says, this is the place you find glory, and now suddenly this, the moon just becomes the moon. It's still beautiful, but it's the moon now. It's not the sun. The stars are still the stars, but we don't go there to tell us who we are. The church, through different means, allows humanity to find ultimate worth so that in all the other places, humanity can collect their worthship chips and reassign them at the only place where we can't lose. Listen, if you say to a six-year-old, if you give me, I, I can imagine me saying this to Olivia when she was six, five or six. Olivia, if you give me your favorite stuffed elephant, Jacob, <laughs> if you give me Jacob, I'm going to give you a brand new card sitting outside in the driveway. Take away the parents, just take away everything else. I'm not sure what she's going to do. In fact, I think she's going to choose the stuffed elephant, isn't she? Now, am I saying the stuffed elephant is bad? Of course not. It's all the child knows. <laughs> The child can feel the animal, touch the animal. The, ch the animal's soft. It sleeps with her. It's safe. It's, it's, it, she relates to it. But don't you see, church, don't you see, in a spirit-filled church, true worship calls humanity into maturity, into reality. We, we have to grow up. God calls the church to show, to reveal his glory as if to ask his people, why are you still clutching the elephant? Why would you do that? Look, look at who God is. Why are you eating that bologna sandwich? Look at God's banquet, you see? Go ahead, bring your, bring your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But look, look at the banquet. You'll let it go. Why are you clutching that bent silver spoon? Look at the riches of God. You see, that's what the church do. The church says, don't you see, humanity, how great you could be in all your life if you stopped worshiping the moon? Because what we forget is the moon is only beautiful because of the sun, isn't it? The stars are only beautiful because of the sun. So do you want to be like the moon? Do you want to reflect God's glory? Then you have to be going to God as the originator of glory and truth and wonderful meaning and value and worth. And when you do, you'll be who God has always intended you to be. That's why it's so essential for church. Now finally... How can we do that as a church? How is it possible for us to worship well as a church? Well, in the story, if you notice, it's very, this very personal exchange, you know? So, why don't you uh, go get your husband? I don't have a husband. Oh, that's right. You've had five and you no longer, uh, they're not married. Now you're sleeping with somebody who's not your husband. You see, it's very personal. And then suddenly she deflects and it gets very community oriented. And that's because the topic changes to worship. Suddenly she says, okay, this isn't about me. Where do we worship? The worshipers are plural. Jesus talks about the worshipers are plural. It's a community event. It's, it's personal until the topic changes to worship, and then it's about community. So I want to briefly pull out that idea, or at least for, for you to acknowledge it, because even if you go to the Psalms, you know, I went through a lot of the Psalms to talk, that talk about worship. I think the most, psalm, the most uh, famous psalm for worship is Psalm 95. It's called the Venite Venite in Latin means come, and the church historically used this through the history of the church as the psalm to call people to worship. We could still do that sometime. It's a wonderful psalm, Psalm 95. But the Psalm 95, the first word is come, venite. And the, the psalmist is calling people to worship. And so what the psalm says in Psalm 95, come let us, see, plural, let us bow down, let us sing for joy, for he is our God, the Lord, our maker. It's a community being called to worship God. Now, why is that so important for me and for God? Because I'm not saying, nor is God saying, that you can't or you shouldn't worship God personally or individually. Of course you can't. My best understanding of worship is that it's kind of 
when you worship alone, like say just you, your Bible, and a tree, or a mountain, or an ocean, it's useful and it's meaningful, but it's best seen as meaningful preparation and practice for the transformation and the power that happens when we worship together. It's just like, imagine practicing violin on your own. You get really good at the violin. It can even be very beautiful alone with the violin. But when you bring that violin into a full orchestra, ah, man, the music is better, fuller, more powerful, more rounded. And in corporate worship, what we do is we harness together what we've been doing through the week in private personal worship, and we harness together, and we all submit in a way. Here's what we submit to. We let the worship leader, in this case, Jesse, guide us through God's word together. We're hearing the same words. We're singing the same songs. We're all listening to the same eternal words of Scripture read from the pulpit. We're all witnessing common things, witnessing confession together, baptism together, partaking of the Lord's Supper together. We're all listening to the same sermon together, like right now, pointing to God's glory and worthiness. We're all listening. We're at the same place, listening to the same truths, being led by the same people. And by the way, I've always wanted a diverse community of worshipers because I believe the more that our worship includes people from other cultures, old people and young people. I hate when a church says, oh, we're kind of old or we're a young church. It should be both. It should be different people, people from different seasons of life, different genders, different skin colors, different, different cultures, different uh, socioeconomic classes. The, the more we have worship where there's people who, who have differing opinions about secondary theological positions, the more beautiful our worship becomes. Because in even singing worship, Jesse knows this, I believe worship is beautiful because sometimes we need to sing songs and sometimes we need to sing psalms and sometimes we need to sing hymns and sometimes we need big band and little band and violin and cello. We even need a banjo from time to time, right? Because that's what worship has different instruments. As long as there's just one preacher, but I'm just kidding. But if we're, here's, here's the thing, we need the diversity because it's what heaven will look like someday. And we'll feel that the more diverse our community becomes. We're also built to love the object, object of our affection even more when other people love that same object. That's why you post a picture of your baby. Because when other people say, oh my goodness, that's so amazing. Right? Like if you're the one that says, oh, it kind of looks like Winston Churchill. Right? Like you're, there's like, what? Anger. Right? You want people to say, I see what you see. And that's what we do when we worship. We see something together. Listen, I, I love my wife. She doesn't, Heather has, does not have to do a thing for me, for, for me to love her more because it's covenantal love. But do you know there are times when it, I happen to love her more, it happens to me. And do you know what it is? It's always, I don't know if she knows this. So you get to find out in front of everybody. She loves that. When I see her talking to other teachers and she doesn't know I'm watching, or she's Zooming with other teachers and they show her respect and honor and they ask her questions. And how do we, Heather, how do you do that? And what are you doing, Heather? Isn't that cool? When you see other people respect her, know her as a teacher, want to learn from her as a teacher, or even collaborate with her as a teacher. When I come home in the evening and I see her sitting on the corner of the bed with a teenager who's spilling out his or her heart, and she, and they look at her because they want her to listen. Like they want her to be there and listen. How do I feel as a husband? I'm like, man, I love her. Or even at church, when I'm leaving church and I'm looking and I see other people talking to her and go up there and please do that today. And you're like, oh, Heather, I haven't seen you. And they talk to you and I'm like, oh, they light up when they see my wife. Like they want to talk to her. And then suddenly I, I love her more. See, when people, when I see people loving aspects of my wife, my heart opens up more to her. Now what do you, that's just a spouse, <laughs> What do you think happens when we come to a church and we look across the room, and we can't do this when we're online, by the way, and we see people that we barely know raising their hands to the same God we love? What do you think happens to your heart? What do you think happens to your children's hearts when they look and they see other moms and dads praising God? Their hearts open up to God even more. I'm not the only one who loves them like this. We all love this same God. When someone's baptized and say, I give my life to Jesus Christ, what happens to your heart? When someone's life is changed and they confess that in church, or when we see people, you see, when we see people loving the same love that we have, we love that love all the more. Always we're built that way. And that's why corporate community 
worship gatherings are essential. And finally, we worship God by worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Now that's, like that was easy to hit that one, right? Because it's right there. I don't want to spend too much time on separating those words, worship and or community we understand, but in spirit and truth. Because, listen, I spent way too much time studying it, and I came back out of it, and I said, I just don't think it's helpful to break them up. Because some people think, oh, God's, uh, Jesus is saying it's important to worship God with your emotion and with your theology, or passionately or in, in intellectually, or experientially and liturgically. I don't. It, not everybody agrees with that. Not everybody even agrees that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit because it's more of a gender, you know, generic pneuma that he's talking about as, is, as in God is a spiritual being, so we have to worship him spiritually. But let me, instead of talking, like splitting those up and talking about what it looks like, let's bring them back together because here's what I do know. Everyone knows that Jesus, okay, back up out of the text. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying... There is going to be a way to worship for you, available to you, right? He's saying, but not quite yet. Do you get that? He's saying, it's coming, the hour's here, but pretty soon that way will open up. Now, the way is spirit and truth, but he's, but he's saying it's not, it's not available to you yet. Now, I remember I used to read this, this text, and I thought Jesus was kind of saying, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, just worship God any way you want. He's not saying that. Nor is he saying... Oh, yeah, you can worship him at, at your place. He doesn't say that. Nor is he saying you have to come to Jerusalem and worship him. So here's the implications of what Jesus is saying. He's not saying God's everywhere, and it doesn't matter what way you get to him. Just find a tree or a mountain or just read a good book, you know, and, and you can get, he's not saying any, any way works. But he's also not saying you must do it here. What he's saying, and I want this to be clear, is he's saying, the hour is coming when the here and or the there doesn't matter. But the way matters. Do you understand that? The way that we worship will always matter. Now, of course, what we know he's pointing to, the hour that he's pointing to, is his death. On the cross, he called out, it is finished. And he was calling out what he promised for this Samaritan woman, a new way. A new way opening up for people to be able to find, experience, ascribe worth to God, worship God, and be changed forever. When Jesus died, and when he says it is finished, what happened to the curtain? The curtain of the temple was rent for to from top to bottom. A place that was, by the way, it was the only true place to go, and Jesus mentioned that as much. He said at least the Jews have the truth. But he was also saying, because there's not a new, there needed to be a new way, he was, he was also, um, he was saying they have truth. In other words, there's order, there's law, there's structure. But it was still completely lacking. It was a way to go to God because it was a truthful way, but it still ended in death. In that way, church, what I want you to see is that the Jew was no better off than the Samaritan. Now, Paul said, he was better off to have the law because it led him to Christ. But here's what I want you to see for a moment. Which way is better? Going the right way and knowing you can never make it or not knowing which way to go. And in that way, the Jew and the Samaritan were alike. They both needed a way. And Jesus is saying in this text, the hour is coming when I will finally open up the way to God. That's why I'm here. That's going to happen soon. When every worshiper, no matter who they are, background, socioeconomic class, where they live, where they go, what mountain they go to, when every worshiper will come to God and only, only be able to come to God through me, you cannot get to God and do an end around Jesus Christ. The Spirit comes in through faith in Jesus Christ. The Spirit leads us into all truth. The entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. The story was about Jesus Christ. It's one, thing, it's, it's one thing to know a scripture reference, church, as we talked last week. The scripture's inerrant. It's objective truth. But without Jesus Christ, we can't even interpret scripture correctly. That's what he said to the people on the road to Emmaus. You haven't, you've been reading it, but you don't know it. You see, without Jesus, we don't know what he's saying. We don't know what the Bible's saying. The Old Testament is like a room fully furnished but dimly lit. 
if you want to know how to sit on a piece of furniture in the Old Testament when you're studying, you have to have the light of Jesus to go into the room and say, oh, now I know what that's for. You see, now I know what that was pointing to. Now I know what that's all about. You need Jesus to illuminate the Old Testament. You want to worship God? You want to go to, to the throne to see what he looks like? Hebrews tells us that the reason we can go boldly to the throne is, is why? Because of the light of eternity, our God, our creator and designer who sits on the throne, that God also became God's son and he became our high priest. And therefore, we can now go to worship. We can boldly go to the throne. Jesus split the universe. Like if we understand the Bible correctly, he became the temple. He became Adam. He became Adam's sin and became a perfect Adam who would never sin. Do you see all of it? He became the sin that needed sacrifice and became the perfect sacrifice for the sin. He became the high priest who brought the hand down to slaughter the lamb. Jesus, 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 Jesus. All through the Bible, it's all about Jesus. Now, a pastor, a preacher in front of a church, a worship leader in front of a church, a community group leader in front of their people, a ministry leader. It's not like we're jewelers, because I believe the jeweler is the Holy Spirit. But all of those people work with the jeweler and say, come, no, don't you see? Listen to the jeweler. I'm right next to the jeweler right now this morning, and I'm saying, look, look, it's the most amazing thing we've ever seen it's not just highly valuable it's priceless so priceless look look so valuable look you you haven't seen it yet if you see it your entire life will change you will forever have now a before and an after if you see it when you see it you will be a true worshiper because you'll be worshiping in spirit and in truth which means through jesus christ to the father let's pray Dear Father, we love you again. We, we uh, through this difficult time in our culture, we need more than ever a church that worships. We, our culture needs a church that worships, who does not get caught in the quagmire of um, temporal thinking, temporal wisdom, temporal science, but who pulls the eyes of their people and the eyes of their people people the outside world looking in pulls their eyes above to something that is true and good and glorious and we go there father to find after we have ascribed ultimate worth after we've experienced that worth we go there father to find you and then we go to be changed when we see you when we experience you the rest of our life changes and father i pray for that for our people i pray for this church to be like that where we put less importance on all of the other things because we're we're all saying listen we're working for the jeweler here and the jeweler wants you to see jesus and my job is just to work with the jeweler and say do you see it it's the answer to every other issue we have, every other circumstance that we feel bad about, every other scattered emotion and priority. The implications are not just something that gives us a reason to have hope for a future, but gives us a reason and a way to live right now. And that way of living is so needed in our world today. So help us to be those people. It's, your, it's in your great and glorious name I pray. Amen.